So, um, hi, um, I'm here to talk about artificial intelligence in science. Um, and I am organizing in Malmo in March the um, first artificial intelligence retreat here. We have two tracks. One is suitable for beginners in artificial intelligence, and one is like for experts to work on your own project in a great um, group of people. So if you're interested in that, talk to me later. Um, OK, so who am I? What am I doing here? Um, the, can we maybe shut the curtains? It's a bit like it's going to be a bit difficult to see the slides. Um, so I have a um, I s I've been working in experimental particle physics. So I got my PhD from Oxford, and sometimes when I say I do particle physics, like people have uh, like an interesting idea about what I do. So like it's doing C plus plus, it's doing artificial intelligence, it's doing electronics, um, and then a little bit of like mathematical calculations. So like definitely in that order, like mostly coding. Um, so I've been working on, um, in this experiment in Japan, T2K, um, and this is how many physicists it takes to work on a medium sized particle physics experiment. Um, uh, and this is the control room at Fermilab for ANOVA, an experiment I was working on later as a postdoc. Um, and this is what a control room looks like. You can see like a huge number of screens basically, basically making sure all of the electronics are working. And there's a security camera up here as well. Um, so we can make sure that the um, construction workers in the fire detector aren't destroying anything. Somehow they thought that would be our responsibility. <laughs> Okay, uh, and I couldn't find a sensible photo of me working at CERN, so that's what a load of physicists falling out of a raft looks like. Uh, okay, but actually I was thinking about it and I started, uh, thanks, uh, in machine learning um, a bit earlier than that, actually already when I was an undergraduate, I've been modeling heat flow off tires and airflow past Formula One cars, so uh, it's really been a long time since I've been uh, been doing this stuff. Okay. But uh, today things are much more exciting than they were like 10, 12 years ago um, because we have the internet so we can recognize kittens, right? Um, there, there, I joke, but there already have been huge breakthroughs in um, computer vision um, in the past years. So things like recognizing animals. So I, I guess it didn't have that many training classes. So the rubber duck is a bird. Um, uh, speech recognition. Uh, who has one of these in their home? Yeah, okay. I think they're quite creepy, but uh, the, the the technology is really impressive now. Um, um, playing games. Uh, so, through uh, uh, playing Go, um, artificial intelligence is now easily able to beat the best players in the world. Um, and driving. Uh, who recognizes this image? No, you don't know. Okay, so a couple of weeks ago, there was this uh, self-driving shuttle. I think it's in Vegas. It got launched, and poor thing uh, crashed on its first day out. So this is it crashing into. Apparently, it wasn't its fault, but okay. Um, but yeah, but I think self-driving is pretty close now. Um, and the reason a lot of this stuff is possible is um, because of something called deep neural networks. So before when we were talking about, um, these have been around for a long time, but uh, it's only recently in the past few years that we've started being able to use them to really do um, uh, human competitive um, tasks like vision and speech recognition. Uh, and the idea is that you basically model your computer program on a biological structure. So in this case, uh, it's, it's the neurons, which is how our brains work, how animal brains work. Um, but instead of sending electrical signals between them, you send information between them using electricity. So I guess it's pretty similar. Um, and if I if we draw pictures of this, when I say deep neural networks, so it's not just like uh, one layer of inputs. So I could have like some images, and then I could have like some output layers. There could be classes like kitten, puppy, rub duck. I don't know. The idea is that you have a hidden layers, um, and then these hidden layers uh, are what allow um, it to find uh, features in the images without you telling it exactly what it's looking for. So it will learn when you're doing image recognition, for example, it'll be learning to find lines and to find curves and different shapes. Uh, and you put a nonlinearity in there, so they can kind of approximate any functions. Uh, so a more uh, concrete example. I'm going to move this mouse. That's better. Uh, so this is this is. I think this is not just three layers. Uh, so we're cheating with the images here. But like you input a face, uh, and then this is something called a convolutional neural network. 
And then some of the early uh, hidden layers will be finding simple features. So they're just finding lines and colors, maybe. Yeah, we've got like black, white, some different angled lines. Um, and then if you go a bit deeper into the network, then it's starting to recognize features. So here we have some eyes. I think that's an ear. It's a bit difficult to see. And then if you go a bit deeper, then it's really turning into a face recognizer. Um, and this technology is pretty. Uh, yeah, pretty impressive by now. Uh, okay, so, but what about in science? Because like we can use this for kittens, but there are a lot of other things in the world. Um, so uh, obvious applications are medical imaging. Um, um, a lot of people are using this for genetics, um, um, astrophysics, where we have huge images that we need to process, uh, condensed matter physics, um, and particle physics, and that's what I'll talk about a bit more later, since. That's my area. Okay. Um, so in 2001, the Nobel Prize was awarded for um, the discovery, well, and the creation of a Bose Einstein condensate. And this is uh, an ultra cold state of matter. So it's uh, a state of ma matter that doesn't naturally exist in the universe. Like the vacuum is not at absolute zero, it has some energy in it. This is a state that is colder than the vacuum. And yeah, so, and when it was discovered, um, they got the Nobel Prize. Um, and let me explain a bit like what it is first, and then I'll say why it's uh, relevant to artificial intelligence. Okay, so there are two um, types of particles that make up matter. Uh, one is a fermion and one's a boson. Uh, and fermions are things like electrons, and they you cannot have an electron in the same state as another electron in the same place at the same time. There's something called this Pauli exclusion principle. And that leads to things like chemistry. So you have the shell structure around atoms, all the electrons being in, in different states. Um, and yeah. Um, and but then there's another type of matter called bosons. And uh, an example of a boson is a photon. So the particle of light, you can have those in the same state. You can have light having all the same quantum numbers, the same energy being in the same place at the same time. And that's why you can use them to do make things like lasers. So if I have bosons, uh, and these aren't photons, they're rubidium atoms, um, and I can c um, and we cool them all into their quantum ground state, then they can all be in the same state, and they can all be in the same place at the same time, which means they're indistinguishable particles. Which means, and if you can't tell the difference between them, then essentially they're the same in the quantum system. So what happens is, here we started off with a load of atoms, and they all have this is the momentum uh, distribution, and they're all moving around a bit. So you have this kind of Gaussian curve, uh, random motion, and at some point you cool them down enough, and instead of having this random motion, they're all moving at the same. So you have this momentum peak. Um, so essentially, it's all behaving as one quantum thing, but it's a macroscopic group of particles. So that's really cool, um, and. How you do this is basically um, you, you take the group of uh, the rubidium gas and you cool it by using lasers to remove the excess momentum from the particles. And this is the laser experiment setup, and this is the little uh, rubidium uh, gas in the middle here. Um, and what what is really cool is that a couple of years ago, a group of uh, scientists in Australia they set up this experiment. So like it wasn't AI; they did everything. I mean, they gave it some lasers to play with and put some rubidium in the middle. But then they said, "Hey, uh, just minimize the temperature or like minimize the volume, actually, which is kind of the same." Um, and it set up the experiment, controlled the lasers, and made this Bose-Einstein condensate in like less than an hour. And I'm not sure how many uh, weeks it took the physicists in the first place to calibrate it, but this is pretty impressive. And it had to do it online, of course. Okay. Um, so another area um, um, where image recognition might be useful, of course, is astrophysics. Um, these images you can get from telescopes now are incredible. The resolution on them, it's really unfair to show them on these screens because, um, yeah, you can't... Uh, you can't see, but if you if you look at it, like get a good laptop screen and Google for some of these images, the resolution is spectacular. So there are different classes of galaxies. There's elliptical, these young galaxies, I think, not really my area. 
Um, uh, and then you have spiral galaxies uh, and uh, irregular galaxies. And an important task in ast astronomy is to classify all of these galaxies into their different types. But what happens if you have like 900,000 images? Well, you have very unhappy graduate students. Um, <laughs> uh, and also, more recently, because astrophysics is cool, they managed to convince uh, members of the public that to do the classification basically on their computers. They send a load of images, and then people sit there like saying, this is a spiral galaxy, this is a... Yeah, and until a couple of years ago, this is really like the, uh, this was the only option. I mean, you didn't, we didn't have algorithms that could cope with these images. They're incredible, uh, high resolution. Okay. And these days we kind of take human level computer vision for granted, like Facebook looks at your photos and it tells you all the things that are in it and what you're doing and who you're with. Um, but six years ago we were still talking about like, would it even ever be possible that computers could have human level vision? Um, and the breakthrough that happened is, uh, like, like we were talking about a bit before with these uh, deep neural networks, it's something called a convolutional neural network. Um, and it's really in 2012 when, when the first breakthroughs to get to, it was handwritten digit recognition and some other things about human level. Uh, and how this works is, it's not just any um, neural network, so we don't just have all of the neurons fully connected to each other, because when you start to get images, the number of neurons you would need, I mean, if you have like, a, a megapixel image, and even if it's only black and white, then uh, the, the, the number of different neurons you'd have, it, it quickly becomes very compu um, computationally uh, infeasible to, uh, to go through all the possible input images. I, in fact, I think there would be more input images than atoms in the universe. So, um, so the idea is instead of um, uh, just using fully connected networks, you take little patches called kernels and you scan over the image. So like you've got a microscope, you're looking for different things. Um, and that's why they're really good at feature detection. So like finding eyes or uh, finding kittens or something. So um, you l look over the image and you have different kernels and they detect different things. And then you go through deeper layers so they can get more complicated. And then at some point in the end, it becomes small enough that you can use a normal fully connected network again. And then you uh, match it onto classes or do some other task. Uh, depending on what you're up to. Mm. And uh, recently, um, there's been, uh, in the past uh, three years or so, there's been a lot of work doing on uh, defeating um, neural networks, which is an uh, area of a lot of fun for me as well. Um, it, what you can do is when you, when you have a neural network and it's recognizing things, you can get another neural network and say, do you think this is a kitten? And it says, yeah, sure. And you get something else. And it says, do you think this is a kitten? And it says, no. And you say, OK, why not? And you actually get them to teach each other like why it, why it caught you out. And then it can tell you, oh, well, if it were a bit more, I don't know, uh, round or furry or something, then I would think it was a kitten. So then they basically train each other how to defeat each other. Um, and then you can uh, get a neural network then that's generating examples that the first one thinks is kittens, but actually they look like handguns. I don't know. Uh, there was a famous artic article recently of someone who managed to 3D print a, uh, a turtle, and um, the Google's um, image recognition algorithm thought that it was a machine gun from every angle. So it was probably more useful to do it the other way around, but uh, yeah. Um, Okay, so in astronomy, uh, you can also use this trick. So if you have a telescope image, and unfortunately it's a bit hard to see here, but um, you start off with a beautiful image of a galaxy, and then you degrade it. So maybe uh, that this is sometimes you might get images of galaxies, and they're not such high resolution, and you want to look at like what it what it was like. Um, so then you can use this uh, generative adversarial network. So you have a, a network that recognizes galaxies, and then you have one that says, hey, take this and make me something that you think is a good galaxy. So you can do it. You can make a fake galaxy. Um, is there anything wrong with this? Yeah, yeah well, see, it, it convinces the network that it's a galaxy, and it looks a lot, I mean, I'm, I, it looks perfectly like a galaxy, but like it's not the original galaxy, right? It's just made it up. Like there, there is actually on the edge of the image here, and it's just like made up some stars and galaxies. Like it's, 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 it's nice for fooling humans. <laughs> uh, okay, um, but it hasn't always been like this. Um, I already mentioned those poor graduate students, but it's been uh, many decades. All right, so let's go back in time a bit, and we'll go on a journey through uh, modern particle physics. 
So it's the 1950s, right? Uh, there's been a lot of money put into um, particle physics research, uh, mostly nuclear physics research. Um, um, physics is starting to take off. Uh, CERN's just opened um, after, uh, um, yeah, uh, in the 50s. Um, and uh, we have a new type of detector, and it's called a, a bubble chamber. Uh, and it makes these incredible images. So, uh, how do I say? Who has ever um, put water in a microwave? Don't do this at home, like and on the internet. Don't do this. Uh, <laughs> super dangerous, right? So if you get um, if you get water and you put it in a container and um, and you microwave it, then you can end up superheating it. And what that means, like water, when it gets to 100 degrees, it starts to boil. But if there's nothing, like no um, impurities, like uh, um, deformations for the little bubbles to form on then it won't boil. It'll just get really, really, really hot. And then if anything does disturb it, then suddenly the whole thing will boil. Um, and this is kind of the same idea with bubble chambers. Uh, so they don't use water. Um, they use superheated um, transparent liquid, and they started off using beer. I'm not quite sure why they decided to use beer. I guess maybe the physicists also needed their drinking budget covered by their research grant. Uh, but these days, uh, it's more likely liquid hydrogen. Um, and the idea is that once you've got the superheated liquid, anything that disturbs it will cause a breakdown. So if you have a, um, a charged particle going through, then along the track it goes past, you get lots of tiny little bubbles forming. And then the whole thing boils. But if you're quick enough photographing it, then you can get the pictures of the tracks of little bubbles going through um, before that happens. So you sh have a particle beam, you fire it at the detector, and then you know when the beam is coming, so you can just take a photograph at the right time. Okay, uh, yeah, they're they're pretty big. You can't make them huge because you have to keep them very pressurized. Um, okay, and these images, they're beautiful images, right? And in the 1960s, right, they didn't, well, yeah, we'll get to that later. In the 1960s, like, they, uh, this is how they analyze them. So you have a big table and um, and you look at it with a human by hand measuring it. Anything you notice about all of these images? Yeah, they're all women, right? And I didn't just like select them for this conference, right? They they really were all women. Um, uh, all of this work is, is is done by women for decades. Okay, so so what is particle physics? Um, lots of particles. Um, you'll meet some of them later. So we have like electrons and things that make up protons and neutrons, and so the atom. Uh, so I'm hoping everyone you know what an atom atom is and so uh, we have atom is made up of a uh, nucleus um, and a nucleus is made of and uh, going uh, and outside the nucleus is not quite like this but this is a less bad image are electrons and inside the nucleus you have uh, neutrons and protons but neutrons and protons they're not fundamental particles they're made up of other particles so you can split them inside them there are, there are quarks uh, three quarks um, and they're held together by other stuff called gluons and the quantum color charge, and everything in there starts getting very weird very fast. Um, uh, so there are many particles that we've discovered in the standard model of particle physics. It's a bit friendly, I like this. Um, and if I, uh, yeah, yeah. So if we just look at the ones that we know exist aren't just made up in theorists' head. Um, so we have, um, this is the electron. Um, that um, we know about, and the electron also has um, heavier partners. So there's something called a muon, and the, these are actually around us and going through us all of the time. Uh, lots of these are being created all of the time in the upper atmosphere as cosmic radiation hits. Um, and then there's an even heavier super partner, uh, um, partner um, called a tau. Um, and then we have the up and down quarks, which make up protons and neutrons. Um, a uh, photon up here, the particle of light. Uh, yeah, and all of these things have heavy uh, particles, heavy um, versions of themselves. Okay. Right, but if only the ones that I've outlined in red kind of exist um, commonly in nature, well, okay, the neutrinos do as well, but we can't see those. Um, then how do we know about all of the rest of them? I'm telling you that all of these things, we've, we've discovered all of these particles. So how do we do it? Yeah. 
Uh, so there's two main techniques. Uh, the first thing is to smash particles into things. And the second one is to smash particles into each other. Um, so this is... Uh, Summary of what, yeah, I know, I know, it's sad, right? <laughs> Don't let me be a biologist. Okay, um, so this is this is nearly true. Uh, we 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 do do all of these things apart from like once the collision has occurred, we don't like poke around in it. We just take a photo of it and then like sit with a computer and analyze it. Okay. Um, Okay, and how do we, oh, <laughs> okay, E equals mc squared, but we're lazy, so uh, c is 1, and um, that was on a previous slide that's not currently in this talk, so I'm not just making up physics here. Um, uh, so we use big particle accelerators, uh, um, basically, um, we take charged particles and we use magnetic fields to get them up to really high velocities and then collide them into things. Uh, so this is the LHC at CERN. Um, yeah, so early on we discovered things like electrons, muons, electron neutrinos for nuclear beta decay, photons, we can see them. Um, and then as with bubble chambers and, and early particle accelerators, you start to split protons and neutrons, you can see up, down, strange quarks. Um, and then later you have more energy, so you can create heavier ones. Um, yeah, and these, uh, the, the bosons of the weak force, which I haven't really mentioned, but they're, they're super heavy, um, so it was a bit later we discovered those. Okay, so let's go to 1989, sort of at the end of the era of scanners, sort of. Um, so nearly all of the particles in the standard model have been discovered. Um, and it's largely been done by humans. Uh, later on in the 80s, they start to get like some computer systems, so they're not all doing it with like pencil and ruler, but uh, it's, it's basically being done by humans. Um, and also at CERN, Tim Berners-Lee has just invented the World Wide Web. Uh, and now we're starting to have a new generation of experiments. We're moving past these beautiful bubble chambers. Okay, so this is the large electron-positron collider. This is in the same um, tunnel as um, the LHC is now. And the radius of this thing, it's 27 kilometers. It's a huge, uh, huge accelerator and it straddles the French and Swiss borders. Uh, and this, like all through the 90s, is the leading particle uh, physics experiment. So you see you have um, uh, around the ring and you have a point where you collide to smash stuff into each other, um, which is here, and then you have a detector around um, the collision point and then you see everything that comes out. What do you notice about these images compared to the bubble chambers? Sorry? Did sh yeah, it, 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 yeah, that's true. It's not just a photograph. There is a computer definitely involved in this. But also, like the the, the tracks of the particles, it's much uh, simpler, right? There's just uh, some straight lines and stuff. You don't see all of these beautiful curves and the overlapping. Um, it, it's digital, and it is possible to analyze digitally because the the, the structure of it is. Um, uh, yeah, we could do a half transform and find lines and images back then, no problem. Um, okay. But it did get more complicated, though, because um, these uh, bubble chambers, they have this big downtime, right? After it's boiled, you can't use it. So uh, you can't cope with very high data rates. But these new detectors, they can be on all of the time. You can just keep smashing stuff into each other and seeing what comes out. So what, what happens is, although the images are much simpler, there are much higher data rates. Um, so it makes simulations of the events to train algorithms. Um, but the cost of... Um, being able to use computers to analyze all of this data is that we couldn't possibly um, analyze photographic level images at that point. Okay, so let's skip ahead to 2000. Uh, this is after the end of the LEP era, well, nearly. Um, and nearly all of the standard model has been discovered by this point. And there's just this one elusive heavy particle that's kind of important because it's giving all of the other ones mass, but nah, Higgs boson, okay. We hadn't found that, so basically the next 12 years is <laughs> um, up, the large uh, electron-positron collider was um, upgraded to the large hadron collider. So instead of colliding electrons into positrons, now we're colliding protons into protons. And you can get these up to much higher energy. Um, uh, and then you can see what comes out. Uh, this is a Higgs candidate. 
So on, um, it was July the 4th, um, 2012, um, like there was a lot of excitement. All the physicists in the world got up really early in the morning to go and see a joint um, seminar that had been organized by the two big experiments at the LHC. And they found very strong evidence uh, for the Higgs and has since reached discovery level. Um, yeah, so that's it. Found all the particles. Great. Okay. Um, so the LHC experiments, they're really, really big challenges. But let's look at this again. What do you notice about this image? It is a bit more complicated than the other one. Um, but it's still not the, 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 the reason it's more complicated. Um, so we have this interaction point again. Protons colliding together here and lots of things coming out. But the reason it's so complicated is something called pileup. So each proton has lots of stuff inside it. Protons are not fundamental particles. They have these quarks inside them. And when they get up to very high energy, they st or you can start probing lots of other stuff that's happening inside there. Lots and lots of stuff in there can collide with each other. Um, so on average, there's something like 27 interactions per, uh, um, per collision. And they're all on top of each other. So we're looking at all of these um, in the detector at the same time. Um, so that's a, a big challenge for the analysis, but still, they're still not so complicated as the bubble chamber images. They're not. Uh, we don't have the resolution, and and there aren't all of the different um, uh, tracks and things that we can see. So yeah, so there's huge data volumes and a lot of cloud computing and stuff has been developed to deal with this. Um, a, a lot of different AI uh, techniques are, are are being used to analyze the data. Um, but it's still this is still not um like photographic level um images um and can we even do this without humans okay so let's um uh recently in the past few years um people have been using a type of detector starting to use a type of detector which like has all of the beauty of bubble chambers but doesn't have the drawbacks and it's called a liquid argon detector and you can see we have very high resolution images here, like lots of little uh, uh, little particle tracks. You can see in tiny little interactions, like beautiful. Um, but these ones, you can keep them on all the time, unlike bubble chambers, and you can also make them much bigger. And these are largely used for looking for something called neutrinos, which are very um, uh, rarely interacting, weakly interacting particles. And this is really the frontier of particle physics now. This is the main thing that we haven't understood at the moment. Um, what do you notice about this image? Yeah, it's black and white. It's beautiful. What are all the red labels? <coughs> it's been lovingly labeled by hand. Like someone has written on, like measured this <laughs> and uh, like said, like all of this is done by hand. Um, this is 2011. Yeah, so this is a conference in 2011. Right, yeah, so all the, the CC and NC events have been identified by means of visual scanning. Yeah. So beautiful detectors. Um, and we have all the technology we need for analyzing amazing uh, particle physics experiments. But these ones are just too complicated. Like uh, they didn't hadn't managed to develop algorithms right, that they could do better than a human could. Um, yeah, so can we analyze the data? And this was a serious discussion at the end of 2011. Like, uh, yeah. But internet kittens to the rescue. <laughs> um, right, so uh, in 2012, we're really reaching the point where human level computer vision is possible. Um, and we can use this for physics. So um, finally, and this is a small uh, liquid argon detector at Fermilab, so using the same technology, um, but a few years later. I think this is 20 this year or last year. Um, now, um, can you use convolutional neural networks to actually find um, the, the tracks and label them yellow and find the shower parts? Yeah. yeah. And it's really working in data. So this is uh, lovingly labeled by a human. And uh, yeah. And then also by. Uh, by a neural net. So, oh yeah, March 14th, 2016. And I guess uh, it was analyzed after that. So yeah, within the past year and a bit. Finally, we can start using these detectors. Um, yeah, and uh, the, the biggest particle physics experiment currently under construction is um, a neutrino um, 
Oh, I should just take a second to explain what's going on. Um, so uh, in neutrino um, experiments are a bit different to these normal collider experiments. So you make a, a particle beam here at Fermilab. Um, you collide charged particles onto a target. You focus the decay products with big magnets. And then you let everything decay. And what comes out eventually is a beam of neutrinos. And neutrinos don't really interact with anything. So it's fine to just send it straight through the Earth. Um, hardly interacting, send it, oh, I don't even know how many kilometers this is, but to lead South Dakota across three states. Um, and then you have a big mine and a big detector in there. They're building huge liquid argon detector so they can see these uh, um, events happening. Yeah. So, um, so human level computer vision means that we can have like bubble chamber like experiments finally with modern day data rates. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thank you very much.